All right, a couple of y'all asked me to do a little getting started guide, so I thought I'd quickly go over that. So if you head on over to rustlang, rust-lang.org, uh, and you click on the getting started button here, so that'll kind of get you into how you actually install it, set it up for different operating systems. I won't go into all that details. You can kind of like follow that. Um, you also have this rust up command to update versions, cargo for running builds, tests, generating documentation. It also refers to the cargo book related to that. Click on this uh, learn link here. It'll give you different resources like the the book as it's known. So this is a great uh, introduction to Rust, kind of a good overview of what the Rust language offers. So anyone that starts learning Rust, you should read the book first and then kind of move on for there, from there by creating different, doing different exercises and things like that. As far as exercises are concerned, there's another web website I've used called uh, Exercise M or something, and it uses a uh, Rust. Uh, one of the examples here is Rust, right? So it's got a bunch of exercises you can use. Uh, another website I've used is this nice little cheat sheet, uh, Rust language cheat sheet here, and it kind of goes over all the different types, um, type system, uh, one-liners, thread safety type things, but pretty much anything you think of in the language, it's a nice little cheat sheet, right, for, you know, how, how the language sort of is built. Uh, another website I would recommend is this, uh, let's see if I can find it here. So Rust by Example. So if you ever are kind of wondering, well, how does this sort of expression work or traits or macros, pretty, pretty much any concept you can think of in Rust, somebody's probably written an entire book uh, specifically about it whether that's macros or embedded rust or uh, multi-threaded or pretty much anything right so uh, you also have this website called rust uh, play.rust so this is a nice way to kind of run tests without having to uh, do things locally on your machine it also will show you like things like the what the assembly code is going to look like llvm mir hr you can do things like build web assembly module for web browsers um, that's also another book is the WebAssembly Rust book. Um, so yeah, let's see here. So another thing I wanted to show you actually is, uh, so kind of get into, if you run into this uh, Rust up doc command here, it actually open up the bookshelf for Rust and all of these files are available locally. So you don't have to use um, the browser or anything, or you, just, you don't have to be connected to the internet, right? To get access to Rust by example or anything else. Uh, unstable book, all that stuff. Cheat sheet, you do need to have that locally, but you can cl uh, just clone that from the GitHub directory, right? Uh, you'll see this, right? Simple example for Hello World, right? I'm just using Vim for my uh, local setup. Um, use the Rust C for the compiler, actually compile that, and then you'll generate a binary, which you can execute, right? Uh, cargo for generating a new project. Here, I'm just doing a standard in. Um, you'll see this a lot. This is uh, called a use statement, right? This use statement is how you kind of import things from either crates or from the standard library or anything else. Uh, this is called a let statement, right? If you want to assign variables. The nice thing about the let keyword actually is you can uh, not only specify the type here, uh, which you might have to do in a lot of cases, uh, but you can also like assign tuples. You can capture variables from uh, other expressions. You can assign it to the result of an expression. Uh, conditionals, you can do it for here where it's inside an if statement for loops, uh, match expressions, anything like that. One thing you'll see in Rust a lot is this mute keyword. So in Rust, you explicitly have to indicate that a variable is can be changed. So it's immutable by default. And you specify MUT to indicate mutability. Uh, for modules, if you want to specify a function to be available, or fields, or structs, or anything you want to export, you have to indicate with the pub modifier, and that'll make sure that it's visible to the outside. Uh, you also see this dot syntax here a lot when it's calling methods. Uh, that's actually just syntactic sugar for uh, this here. So you see standard IO, standard in, read line, and it's passing in the reference to standard in. You'll see the second argument to that function is the uh, buffer, and it's expecting a mutable variable, 
uh, mutable variable that is referenced, and we call that a uh, mut mutable borrow, right? So it's kind of a little bit different. You might have heard this in other languages called passing by reference. Uh, in this case, it's more than that because we're also expecting it to be mutated, but because it's also a borrow, it indicates things to the compiler that I'm temporarily allowing this function to have ownership. And you'll hear that a lot in Rust is concept of ownership. It just means that that function is now responsible for this uh, reference here. And so that when that function uh, returns, now it's essentially now I'm within this scope of this function. Now I have uh, ownership over that uh, reference now. So uh, this kind of gets into the details of what the compiler and the borrow checker is making sure it has these rules for what you can and can't do. One of them is how you can't have a immutable borrow at the same time of mutably borrowing, which just basically means that like, if I have a, a variable that is, I'm not expecting to change, and I have another variable that is, uh, can be changed, and they all point, they both point to the same thing, uh, that's, we don't want that to happen ever. So uh, Rust ensures that uh, using the borrow checker, the compiler. I'll, I'll, specify, I'll say scope a lot, but it actually is kind of sort of the same thing as what you'll hear is uh, lifetimes. And that's uh, the compiler's way of kind of determining when things go in and out of scope, right? This is also known as resource acquisition is initialization. So you hear that a lot in the Rust community. Uh, this is called a try operator, right? So that's just the way to kind of exit early if you've got like an error handling or an option. Um, you'll see this also as a generics argument here. So the compiler uses a concept called monomorphization, and that's just a way to generate uh, code, generate um, monomorphic code from polymorphic code. So you've got a generic function for ID here, it takes type T, and it's being used with an integer and a string. So the result here is you've got two functions, one's an integer and one's a string. Uh, you'll notice a lot you don't need semicolons or return keyword. You can still use them. Uh, a lot of times they're used to kind of exit early from match or nested if statements or loops or anything like that, or just in this case, returning an error. Uh, you also notice this is actually with this exclamation point here. That's called a macro. So a macro is just a way to generate code from code, right? Uh, you might be wondering why is the print line a macro actually, and there's the reason why it is actually due to move semantics, and also because we want to accept an arbitrary number of arguments here. Um, without without this, this actually statement wouldn't work because the print line function would be capturing this variable for x, and now we wouldn't be able to use x beyond this point uh, because it's a macro. It actually works right so. And I mentioned that, right? It captures it. That's also known as ownership, taking ownership, right? Right, cargo run, hello world. Um, I kind of won't get into too much detail here, but you know, there's a lot of influences in Rust. Uh, type systems come from Haskell a little bit. Um, some of the C++ influences, uh, resource acquisition as, you know, kind of the, the ideas come from them, the patterns, right, uh, come from there. There's this big emphasis on memory safety a lot you'll hear. Um, so there's things like null pointers, dangling pointers, data races. These are things that are meant to be provably not possible in Rust. Uh, that's the at least the idea here. Um, yeah, so I won't go into that. Memory management, right? So Rust doesn't have any concept of garbage collection. And the reason why is because of this idea of uh, managing the, tracking the, uh, Tracking the state or the scope of different objects, it's called the lifetimes, and knowing when things memory needs to be freed up, right? Won't go into that. So mutability, we mentioned that a little bit. So here you've got a variable here that's being declared. It's not, it's immutable, which means it can't be changed. So if you attempt to change it later on, right, this is going to throw an error by the compiler. Uh, ownership, right? So this idea of like, after I've assigned something 
or transferred it to a function by calling it, if I don't, if I'm not, if that function isn't temporarily borrowing it by reference or temporarily borrowing it in a mutable way, if I'm simply just passing it along, then now that function is now responsible for freeing up that object's resources. We don't have to worry about that in Rust because by the end of the, that function or when that variable goes out of scope, then those resources are uh, will be freed up, right? The drop or the destructor, as it's known in other languages. Uh, so that's actually known as move semantics, which means it's like, hey, now you're responsible for this object. Uh, and this kind of ensure that you don't have any kind of dangling pointers and uh, things like that. A little bit of background in type theory um, that I would highly recommend taking a look at uh, computer file. It's a great video here, computer science, mathematics, type theory that kind of goes into this idea of programs as proofs and how the terms are interchangeable where between uh, the type systems and the concepts within programming and uh, what we would see in proof uh, type theory and uh, mathematical objects is kind of being this interchangeable concepts. Um, so that's kind of gets into like this idea of Curry Howard isomorphism. You have proofs and models of computation are actually the same thing in mathematical objects. And this was discovered by uh, actually Haskell Curry and, and others where uh, Lambda calculus kind of gets into that. Um, it's something to just kind of consider when you look at different uh, programming languages, like what are the type systems that it provides. If it doesn't provide any type systems, uh, like in sort of dynamic languages, you'll notice a lot in dynamic languages where uh, you get variables and a lot of times you'll have these guard type checks where the because there's no type system, uh, there's a type system underneath, because but because it's not strict in that way, You'll see a lot of code that's written to make sure like well as long as if this variable is this type or it has this function or it looks like this then i'm allowed to run the rest of the code more strict languages just kind of do that by default uh, right uh, for rust you have uh, some concepts being pulled from linear types which is kind of related to linear logic theory and uniqueness types there's also existential types uh, records to uh, kind of represent abstractions, traits. Um, there's also dependent types, uh, which are a nice thing to look at, where you have some type that depends on the implementation of something else. Those are called like effects. All right, we know this from like, you know, this is a type system for x equals 10. This is a predicate logic. Um, you haven't take, take, taken a look in type theory, it's kind of really fascinating to kind of go down the rabbit hole there. Uh, you also have this substructural type systems, right? And one of them that Rust is based on is this concept called affine types, uh, which means it can't be used more than once. And we know that because, um, just a note actually on ordered types, right? This is great for modeling stack-based allocation. And normal types, right? That's more like cloning. It can use any number of times. So affine types, this is actually where we get the move semantics from. So as soon as X is moved, then X no longer becomes usable. So I can't use it beyond this point because it's it's been moved. So that's uh, the idea of it can't be used more than once. As soon as it's, been in, as soon as it's on the right side of the uh, assignment operator, then it's been moved, right? Or otherwise, if a function has actually captured it by you're now passing it along and now I can't use it anymore. And it's not by reference. Uh, you also have relevant subtypes, uh, this type system where it must be used at least once. That's the what you'll see in lint errors where it, it, something's going unused, right? And then linear types, uh, which kind of goes into this idea of it's used exactly once. Uh, safety deallocate an object after it's used, right? And Rust has support for some of these linear types through uh, lint annotations. I won't go into detail on that. There's this cool language actually I came across called ATS that has a formal type system that kind of lets you define linear proofs. So you have this allocation of a variable and you have this other allocation of a file and each of these return not only the 
associated variable, but it also returns a proof. And a PF file is given FP uh, file descriptor. It, those would go, if those were going unused and you didn't actually deallocate them at the end by freeing those resources, uh, ATS would actually create a compilation error because these variables would go unused. And these, so in order to have those variables, those proof variables used, you must actually free those resources. Um, ATS has a lot of cool things like uh, linear proof kind of uh, ensuring that variables are kind of intertwined and uh, functions and I don't know. It, it, fascinating language. Uh, right? But Rust kind of does this autom automatically because of its knowledge of those lifetimes. Um, yeah, another thing to kind of look at, right, is dealing with polymorphism. We mentioned that earlier with the uh, ID uh, generating functions from uh, that ID type, right? Dealing with that. Uh, Rust is kind of based around this idea of implementations, traits, and structure types. So structure types kind of gives you the ability to define your fields. You also see this a lot. This is a annotations or the uh, attributes on a func on a structure, right? Uh, implementations, right? So you can implement multiple things for a struct. So this is I'm um, implementing the op the add operator for the point. And then given another other point, I can return a new point. So uh, that's where the add or I'm sorry, that's where the implementation traits kind of structure types comes from. Uh, you also can do type aliases, right? So that's fun. Anyway, there's there's tons of things to look at. Um, again, that cheat sheet is a good way to kind of get an overview of things. Um, Crates.io, exercise, Rust book, all that stuff. So, and there's tons more stuff that I haven't even begun to touch. So, uh, yeah, thanks for watching. Be sure to hit that subscribe button and like, and I'll see y'all in the next one.